Welcome back. This is the Tutor Wizard. What we're going to do this time is we're going to do a pre-calculus final exam review in uh, a couple of parts, possibly three parts. We'll see. I've got a ton of problems, over 20 problems with a bunch of parts and a bunch of different functions for each kind of problem. To get started, number one wants to find the equation of a line in the plane L2 through a given point 3, negative 1, and parallel to a given line L1. What we're going to do with this is, first of all, we have to, to build up this line in the plane. We need a point, which they did give us, and we need a slope. Therefore, what we need to do is, we're going to determine what the slope of the line that they gave us is. Then we're going to look at the conditions on whether our line is parallel or perpendicular to this line. And then we can find the slope using a theorem. And then we're going to use the point and the slope to use the point slope form of the line to build our equation of the line L2. To do this solution. I need the slope of this line. This says I'm going to solve for, basically they give me 4x minus 5y equals 1. I'm solving for y. So this says I'm going to bring the 1 to the other side and the 5 to this side. This says 4x minus 1 equals 5y. Or y dividing by 5 gives me y is 4 over 5 minus x minus 1 fifth. This is L1 in y equals mx plus b, or slope-intercept form. Now what I can do is the number in front of the x is the slope. So m1 is 4 fifths. I have the slope of this first line now. What we're going to do with that is compare it to the conditions of what we were given for what, whether our line was parallel or perpendicular to this line. In this case, L2 is parallel to L1, and this means that the slopes are equal to each other. If lines are parallel, their slopes are equal to each other. If lines are perpendicular, they're negative reciprocals, they say. We'll do another one of those in the next video. This gives me the point P3, negative 1, and because L2 is parallel to L1, we have that m1 is equal to m2, which is equal to 4 fifths. They're both equal to this, so I have the slope and the point. This tells me that, in general, given a point x1, y1, and a slope m, using the point-slope form of a line, y minus y1 equals m x minus x1. For us, this gives us y minus minus 1, which is plus 1, equals our slope 4 fifths x minus 3, and this is the an equation of the line L2 that we were looking for. The next question is finding f average on an interval a, a plus h if f of x equals this rational function or the ratio of two polynomials. This is extremely important because this limiting process of this process is actually the definition of derivative when we actually do calculus. What we're actually doing is finding the average rate of change for if I have a function like this, we're finding a point A and a point close, but we're scaling it up so you can see, but and then we move away a little bit, A plus H. What that gives us is this secant line which joins and then we have F of A plus H and F of A. What that tells us is basically we're just finding the slope of that secant line, which is the change in uh, f over the change in x. So that slope of that secant line, which we're going to define as f average, is the change in f over the change in x, which is f of a plus h minus f of a over a plus h minus a, and the a's cancel on the bottom, so we get f average, long story short. F average is f of a plus h minus f of a over h. This is the formula for f average on an interval a, a plus h. We're going to use it for this function and simplify. 
I need f of a plus h and f of a. Let's do that separately. f of a plus h. I put a plus h wherever x is in this expression. I'm putting a plus h in the little basket. So that means a plus h has to go here and a plus h will have to go here. This gives me a plus h plus 1 over a plus h minus 1. <coughs> And f of a is equal to a plus 1 over a minus 1. Now what we're going to do is use a formula. F average is 1 over h. <coughs> we're just going to leave the 1 over h on the bottom. Yes, we're dividing by this. Dividing by h is the same thing as multiplying by 1 over h. Dividing by 2 is the same thing as multiplying by 1 half. The reason I'm doing that is because I'm going to have a fractional expression to add on the inside anyways, and I'm going to simplify that first. This gives me f of a plus h is a plus h plus 1 over a plus h minus 1. And then we're going to do minus f of a plus h minus f of a over h. f of a was a plus 1 over a minus 1. I'm just going to cheat a little bit because I know what I'm going to do in the next move. In my next move, I'm adding fractions. I need a common denominator. In this case, what I do is because they're variables and I have A's and H's in there, the easiest thing to do is multiply by what's missing. The common denominator is the product of these two things. Therefore, I multiply this one by what's missing, A minus 1, in the form of 1. A minus 1 over A minus 1. The dirty little trick I always like to do. And then this one is missing what? A plus H minus 1. So I multiply by A plus H minus 1 over A plus H minus 1. Now I have a common denominator. Yes, we're going to have to FOIL all those things out. Luckily, everything in the one step is really horrible because I have to FOIL everything. You're like, there's going to be so many terms. But then there's a really gratifying step right after where everything cancels off. And then we get the factor H out of every term. And everything will work out if we did everything correctly. Let's do that. This becomes, now that I can simplify, I'm going to write that as equals 1 over h. I'm going to leave the h on the outside still. On the top, I have a plus h plus 1, a minus 1, minus a plus 1, a plus h minus 1, all over a plus h minus 1 times a minus 1. We can put the h in here like this. This is what we have. This equals this, F average. Because the average rate of change, F of A plus H minus F of A over H is equal to this. Yes, now we have to FOIL all these things out and then it will simplify fairly nicely. Relatively speaking, of course. So A times A is A squared. And then I get minus A and then I get H A and then minus H and then plus A and then minus 1. That was foiling out the first ones. In the second one, I'm going to get minus something over. The bottom didn't change. H A plus H minus 1. A minus 1. In this one, I'm going to get A times A is A squared plus A H minus A plus a plus h minus 1. So immediately what I see, even inside the brackets, a and a cancels, and a and a cancels inside the brackets. Let's clean that up. Equals a squared plus a h minus h minus 1 minus a squared plus a h plus h minus 1 all over h times a plus h minus 1 a minus 1 is now what we have. I can erase the top. Let's simplify this a little bit more. Now the negative distributes onto every single one, remember. I'll write that out. This becomes a squared plus a h minus h minus 1 minus a squared minus a h minus h plus 1 all over h a plus h minus 1 a minus 1. Now this is the gratifying part where everything cancel, cancel, cancel. So what did we get? 
a squared minus a squared cancels, a h minus a h cancels, negative 1 plus 1 cancels, and careful, negative h and negative h gives me negative 2 h over h, a plus h minus 1, a minus 1. Now, every term that didn't have h in it cancelled, and everything that's left has an h in it. In this case, we only have one, so now we can cancel the h on the bottom. And this gives us, finally, negative 2 over a plus h minus 1 over a minus and This is our final answer. F average is equal to negative 2 over a plus h minus 1 times a minus 1. In calculus, the definition of derivative is taking the limit as h approaches 0 of this thing, and so h will go away, and we get the derivative we're going to call it in the next class or the next course you take. All right, the next problem, number 3, is going to be prove the trigonometric identity. What we're going to do with these ones is, usually with the trigonometric identity, I start with the more complicated side. Classically, they make it the left-hand side, but it could be the right-hand side. Or sometimes when they're both really complicated, I would show both of them equal the same uh, common thing, and then they're equal to each other, the left-hand side, right-hand side. In this case, because the right-hand side is simple, it's just cosecant, which is 1 over sine. This side is more complicated and has fractions and everything else. I'm going to try and manipulate this side and turn it into this side. So proof. I have sine theta over 1 plus cos theta plus cotan. The first thing in trigonometry is turn everything into sine and cosine if you're stuck. So cotan is cos theta over sine theta. Now I see I'm adding two fractions. I was adding fractions either way, but now this gives me more room. What do I need? I can't need a common denominator. So I'm going to write this as sine theta over 1 plus cos theta. This I'm missing sine theta, so I'm going to do sine theta over sine theta is my common denominator. Multiply by 1 plus cos theta over sine theta. What am I missing? I'm missing 1 plus cos theta, so I multiply by 1 plus cos theta over 1 plus cos theta. Let's simplify. This gives me, on the top, I get sine times sine, which is sine squared theta, plus cos theta, plus cos squared theta, on the top, over 1 plus cos theta, times sine theta. What does that give me? I'm now going to use the Pythagorean identity. Sine squared plus cos squared is 1. So I see that immediately. These two guys equal 1. Cos squared plus sine squared equals 1 for any angle. So this gives me 1 plus cos theta over 1 plus cos theta times sine theta. Oh, and then I see that this will cleverly cancel with this. And I'm given, let's squeeze it in, 1 over sine theta, which is cosecant theta, which is the right-hand side. So one sine theta over 1 plus cos theta plus cotan theta does, in fact, equal cosecant theta when we simplify. The next question, number four, is going to be composition, fog and goth again. So F following G and G following F it wants if f of x is x plus 1 over x minus 1, and g of x is this quadratic polynomial x squared minus 2x plus 3. Let's try this out. The first one, f following g of x is equal to, by definition, f of g of x. What does that do? I write f of, what is it going to do? g sends us to this quadratic x squared minus 2x plus 3. That's where it sends a point x. Now I'm going to put this thing wherever there's an x in the expression for f. So I'm going to put it here and here, just like when we did a plus h. It's the same function, in fact, the f of x. So we're going to put this instead of a plus h. We're going to put g of x wherever there was x in the expression for f. And that's going to give me equals x squared plus minus 2x plus 3 plus 1 over x squared minus 2x plus 3 minus 1. Yes, you can simplify that to add the 3 and subtract, or add the 3 and the 1 and subtract the 3 and the 1, but for now, this is what, don't simplify, this is f following g, or fog. 
g following f, g following f of x is going to be g of f of x, which is equal to g of f did what? This guy, x plus 1 over x minus 1. Now I put that wherever there's an x in the expression for g here and here. So g does that thing x plus 1 over x minus 1 squared minus 2 times x plus 1 over x minus 1 plus 3. This is f following g of x and this is, or sorry, this is g following f of x and the other one was f following g of x. Clearly they are not equal to each other. Fog did not equal Goff in general. Composition is not commutative binary operation. Next. The next question asks for us to compute the exact value of sine of 5 pi over 12. I said, and what they're doing essentially is actually giving us more unit circle values, exact unit circle values of 5 pi over 12 instead. So I'm going to suspect we're going to use either use half angle identities or double angle identities or addition and subtraction angle identities and formulas to crack this and get exact values. Let's try and see if we can see this as a sum. Let's note that pi over 6, 6 and the 4, plus pi over 4. Let's try that one. Let's see what we get with that. I'm adding two of these guys, and I'm hoping it's equal to this guy. I want to notice that this guy's a sum, and then I can use the addition formulas for sine of x. What do I get here? I have, I need a common denominator, which is in fact 12. So here I need two and here I need three. So that's exactly what I needed. And this is going to give me two pi plus three pi over 12, which is five pi over 12. So what have I noted there? I noticed that five pi over 12 is pi over six plus pi over four. Pi over six and pi over four are both unit circle values. I know what those are. On the first quadrant of the unit circle values, I have pi over six is here and pi over four and pi over three. So here I know that we have cos is root three over two and pi is one sine is one half at pi over six. And at pi over four, I know they're both equal to one over root two and one over root two. And then at pi over three, we know that cos is one half and sine is root three over two. I squish those in there, they're really small values. But this is the unit circle values. I know what those values are of sine and cosine. I'm gonna use that fact to find out what sine of this five pi over 12 is. Let's do that. Sine of 5 pi over 12 is actually equal to sine of pi over 6 plus pi over 4 is what we're doing. Now I'm going to use the addition formula for sine. This is sine of pi over 6 times cos of pi over 4 plus sine of pi over 4 times cos of pi over 6. And now I'm going to use the unit circle that I just erased. I'm going to use all those values to get the exact values and get an expression for sine of 5 pi over 12. This is equal to, this says that sine of 5 pi over 12 is equal to sine of pi over 6, which is 1 half. Cos of pi over 4 is 1 over root 2 plus sine of pi over for 4 is 1 over root 2 also, and cos of pi over 6 is root 3 over 2. So I can factor 2 root 2 out of these, and I'm going to get 1 over 2 root 2. 1 plus root 3 is the exact value of sine of 5 pi over 12. Next. Okay, for number 6. What we're going to do is solve the trigonometric equation 1 plus sine theta equals 2 cos squared theta. This one I like because cos squared theta we're going to turn into uh, all, we're going to turn this all into sines and then we're going to turn into a quadratic in sines essentially temporarily to solve the quadratic equation. Let's do that. What I see is I have 1 plus sine theta equals 2 
and I immediately know that co squared theta plus sine squared theta equals 1. So cos squared theta equals 1 minus sine squared theta from the Pythagorean identity, the most useful one, pretty well. I'm going to put that in there immediately. Co squared theta is 1 minus sine squared theta, which is equal to 2 minus 2 sine squared theta. Now the idea is, and now I have all, I have a quadratic in sine theta I see already. If you can't see it, just a second. What I'm going to do is you move everything to one side, trying to keep the, the highest power positive, and then we're going to see if we can factor this and find the roots of this. Let me change that a little bit. So we have this equals this, 1 plus sine theta plus 2 sine squared theta minus 2 equals 0. I'm going to bring these ones to the other side. This one will become plus and this will become minus. What that gives me is 2 sine squared theta plus sine theta minus 1 equals 0. What you can cleverly do is let x equal sine theta. Then what that gives us is 2x squared plus x minus 1 equals 0. We can try and solve this. You can see it's now a quadratic, but it's quadratic in sine theta not in x, but we're going to let it equal x temporarily. Let's play that game. I need 2x times something and x times something to equal 0. So what is this going to be? What can I have that multiplies? I'm going to get 2x and then I'm going to get minus 1. Is that right? 2x. And then so I need this one to be plus and this one to be minus. This is what we're going to get. What a, let's double check. I just played a clever game there, but if you're watching, you can also use the quadratic formula and complete the square and find all the roots. But cleverly, I have 2x squared plus 2x minus x would give me a positive x and then minus 1. So these are the roots. What does that say for us? This says 2x minus 1, x plus 1 equals 0 if and only if 2x minus 1 equals 0 or x plus 1 equals 0. This says that 2x equals 1 or x equals 1 half or x equals negative 1. So x equals negative 1. These are the two choices. Remember what x was? x was sine theta. So now what that says is sine theta equals 1 half or sine theta equals negative 1 are the two solutions to that. When does that happen? Sine theta equals one half and sine theta equals negative one were the two uh, equations that we have to now solve for this being true. This is true again using the unit circle when it's sine one half. Sine theta is one half when theta is equal to pi over six. And where is the other one? This is the first one, pi over 6, and theta is in this half, so it's going to occur at this one also, at 5 pi over 6. So theta is 5 pi over 6 also, plus it didn't give any, any restrictions or an interval, so that means we have to add multiples of those. The safest way to do that is that theta is pi over 6 plus 2 pi k, and theta is 5 pi over 6 plus 2 pi k. k is any integer. That solves the first one. And when is sine theta equal to negative 1? That's right here at 3 pi over 2 and multiples of that. So for this one we get theta is equal to 3 pi over 2 plus 2 pi k for any integer. These are all of the solutions here and here and here are all the values which make this true. Solving trigonometric equations. Next. The next one we're going to do, number seven, is going to be show f of x is 1 to 1 and find its inverse f minus 1 of x. Oh, if f of x equals, let's do a baby one at first to show you how this works, 5x minus 4. So we're going to give you a simple linear function. We're going to show that it's 1 to 1 and find this. This type of question might not be in each of the curricula of every instructor, but 
Uh, it's their the notion of inverse functions is fairly important for calculus later on, so I'm going to do one of these anyways. Inverse of a function, which is one to one. First of all, for one to one, what do I need? We're going to assume that we have two points where their images are equal. So we assume that we have f of x1 equals f of x2 for some two points, and we want to show x1 equals x2. Indeed, we know that our function is 5x minus 4, so that has to say that 5x1 minus 4 has to equal 5x2 minus 4, because they're equal there. Subtracting 4 from both sides gives me, or sorry, adding 4 to both sides gives me 5x1 equals 5x2. And then multiplying by 1 fifth, or dividing by 5, gives me x1 equals x2, and this says f is one to one f actually is a one to one function now we can find its inverse how do we find the inverse what we do to find the inverse is we uh, set y equal f of x then we solve for x we interchange x and y and we can get the inverse function from this process let's do that to find the inverse let y equal f of x equal 5x minus 4 and then we're going to solve for x this gives me y plus 4 equals 5x. Notice it's the same algebraic operations to create the inverse algebraically as it was to show it was 1 to 1. First we added 4 to both sides. Now we're going to divide by 5 or multiply by 1 fifth. And this tells me that x is equal to 1 fifth y plus 4. They say interchange x and y. And this means that I put y where x is and x where y is, so that says y equals one-fifth x plus four. We usually make x the independent variable, so we're creating a new function, y equals f of x, which is our inverse. And they say now that this says that the inverse of x is equal to one-fifth x plus four if our original function f of x was five x minus four. Those are the two functions. Coincidentally, we have a way of checking this. We have composition. They say this all the time. F following F inverse of X is X, and F inverse following F of X is X. What do they mean by that? It means you have a check on your exam to check whether you've got this calculation correct or not. Let's try one of them. F following F inverse of X is F following F inverse of X, which is F of, what does F inverse do? It does this, so I'm going to do 1 fifth X plus 4. Now what do I have to do? I have to apply F to that thing, so that equals 5 times this thing, 1 fifth X plus 4 minus 4. I can get rid of, uh, let's not get rid of them. What does that do? The 5 and the 1 fifth cancels, and that gives me x plus 4 minus 4, which is these cancel equals x. So we did it right. If f of x equals 5x minus 4, the inverse of this function is 1 fifth x plus 4. Let's do one more. So for the number 8, for the last question in this first video of free calculus final exam review questions, what we're going to do is solve a nonlinear inequality. 16x is less than or equal to x cubed. So when does this happen? The strategy always is don't try to divide by your variable. You'll divide out by this. Everyone wants to divide by x and get 16 is less than x squared and then square root. This is not how we do this. Bring everything to one side, factor it into linear factors, make a table, find out when it's positive or negative. Let's do that. We have... 16x is less than or equal to x cubed if and only if 0 is greater than or, e or less than or equal to x cubed minus 16x. I'm bringing this to the other side. I'm subtracting 16x from both sides so that I get everything on one side of the inequality. It doesn't matter whether it's less or greater than. Bring everything to one side, whichever one you want. Now the strategy is factor it. This is if and only if. I see I have x in both terms. That's the rule one of factoring. If you can see something common in them, take it out. That gives me x times x squared minus 16 is less than or equal to 0. And this gives me 16 is 4 squared, so I see a difference of squares. This is x, x plus 4, x minus 4 is less than or equal to, or sorry, this should be greater than or equal to 0. I flipped it around. 
If you don't like that, this was our statement, keeping it the same. So, and then this says if and only if zero is less than or equal to x times x plus four times x minus four. Get it right. Now, what do I do with this? This is equal to zero at negative four and zero and four. So I'm gonna make a clever table. Negative infinity to negative four, negative four to zero, zero to four, four to infinity. And I'm gonna find out when my pieces, linear pieces are positive or negative on those intervals and then find out when the overall nonlinear expression is positive or negative. So this is my lowest root, x plus 4, x minus minus 4. The root is negative 4. x minus 0, or just x, is this root 0. And then x minus 4, the root is 4. So I had three roots, negative 4, 0, and 4. And those are linear factors in that polynomial, cubic polynomial. If you set your table up like this, now this one is, I do that because this, is, this one is the product of the three of them. What's that? X times X plus four times X minus four. And then we wanted what? We wanted this to be larger than or equal to zero. Non-negative is what we want. So in the first interval, I have negative four, zero, four, Mm, 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 mm. This is what the pictorial thing where you just need to pick anybody in there. They're all positive or all negative. So I pick negative five in here, a nice integer. Negative five plus four is negative. Negative five is negative. Negative five minus four is negative nine, which is negative. Three negatives, two of them cancel to give me positive, but he stays negative. So that's not what I wanted. I'm not going to keep this. In the next interval in here, I have, say, negative three is in here. So I'm going to pick that one, negative 3, negative 3 plus 4 is positive, negative 3 is negative, negative 3 minus 4 is negative 7, which is still negative, so, but now when I multiply I get positive, I do want that. In here, pick 1, 1 plus 4 is positive, 1 is positive, but 1 minus 4 is negative 3, which is negative, so when I multiply these together I get a negative, and that's bad, and then in the last interval 5 is in here. 5 plus 4 is 9, which is positive. 5 is positive. And 5 minus 4 is now positive 1, which is positive. So I get positives. And that's what I wanted, not negatives. What does this tell me? And because I had the weak inequality less than or equals, I can use square brackets where our inlet is positive infinity or negative infinity. And that gives us... I just erased it. I could have probably done the calculation before we erase the table but from that table this is true if and only if x is in it wasn't the first interval so it was not negative infinity to negative four but negative four to zero we get to keep and then uh, zero to four was no and then four to infinity was a yes so we're going to keep negative four zero union for infinity is when this is true. Pictorially, what that's saying is this. I had negative 4, I have 0, and I have 4, and our cubic polynomial is doing this, essentially. And what it says is from negative infinity to negative 4, we're less than 0. We're below the x-axis. From negative 4 to 0 here, we're above the x-axis. Right here is what we kept. We're throwing this away. And then between 0 and 4, we were below the x-axis, and so we're not going to keep that. And then from 4 to infinity, we were above the x-axis. It's asking, this is asking when is this cubic polynomial above the x-axis, essentially. So subscribe below, hit the notification bell if you want more of these videos. We're going to do at least one more, probably two or three more videos in the pre-calculus review. We're just going to do a ton more problems. See you next time.